As Naomi said, my name is Linda. I'm currently a PhD student at the Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, and I'm also an associate fellow at the Global Network for Extremism and Technology um, and at a German think tank for de-radicalization. Apologies for not turning my video on. I do have an unstable internet connection. So in case I stop speaking mid-sentence, uh, it's not because I cut you off, it's uh, the connection, but let's hope it won't happen. I, I hope it won't happen because otherwise I have to deliver your, your presentation. <laughs> Don't do this to me. <laughs> I'll try. Uh, I talked to my laptop not to do it. I hope uh, it will listen to me. Yes. So as you heard, I'm going to talk about gamification in online radicalization processes. And to give you an idea um, of what we're going to do um, in the session today, I'm going to give you a presentation um, for around 20 minutes um, just to sort of start you off on the topic. Um, we'll then have a short Q&A. You don't have to use the full 20 minutes. This is just to make sure that everyone understood what I was talking about and that we're all on the same page in terms of understanding. Um, if you don't take the 20 minutes, we have more time in the end to have the general discussion. And uh, one question from me, Linda, sorry for no. interrupting. Is it, um, uh, is it okay for you to, uh, to ask uh, questions also during the, uh, during the presentation or you want to take all the questions after uh, this 20 minutes? Uh, I would like to take all the questions after if possible. Perfect, perfect. So last thing, last thing. Uh, we have uh, during our session, our graphic recorder, Magda Arajne. So for now, I wanted just to share also uh, my screen, uh, maybe not my screen, but her screen. Uh, so Magda Arajne is preparing a um, graphic illustration of the session. So everybody will get Magda's, um, you know, um beautiful beautiful poster hello <laughs> so i will keep i will keep her screen uh, running uh, for the participants to see as well mm -hmm. sure thank you um so as i said however long the q a uh, we need that that we're going to take if it only takes 10 minutes we'll have more discussion time in the end in any case um after the short q a um, I'm going to send you three links. You can choose one of three TED Talks uh, on gamification to watch. Um, and then we'll come back to the session after you watched it and we can share uh, your thoughts. We can have a discussion um, on gamification in a broader sense. But first, let's get started with the presentation. So I'm going to talk about what do I actually mean by gamification. Uh, I'm going to give you some evidence of uh, gamification extremist milieus. Uh, then we're going to ask what are the actual mechanisms of influence of gamification on radicalization. I'll give you a short conclusion. And then I have a slide, how can I get started? This is something you're welcome to screenshot um, because I'm not going to talk about every single book and article that's on there, but just something for you to, um, to look at if you want to look into gamification any further. Right, so what is gamification? It's a buzzword, obviously, that has been uh, thrown around for the last maybe five to eight years in various uh, variations. And in terms of radicalization, um, gamification has been, or it has been termed gamification, how ISIS uses uh, Call of Duty references to the identitarians developing their own video game, etc. cetera. Um, so lots of different things. But today, I am going to focus uh, on the, let's say, classical definition of gamification, uh, which is the use of game design elements within non-game contexts. So I'm not going to talk about video games as such, but how game elements are applied in non-game environments um, for psychological reasons to facilitate radicalization processes. As you read in the description, it's a relatively young field of research, so there isn't much to go on. Uh, it's only been applied for around 10 years, and the real uptake has only been in the last maybe two to three years. It's been applied um, in the commercial sector, in education, health, etc. cetera. Um, so a wide variety of contexts, but there isn't that much known yet. Gamification usually means 
um, that points, leaderboards, badges, and other classical gaming elements are incorporated into non-gaming contexts. So for example, if you're competing with your coworkers uh, for badges or points, that's gamification. Um, but also on fitness apps, if you are motivated by points and badges uh, to win against your friends and therefore you work out more, um, that too is gamification. So it's usually aimed at a behavioral change, but that doesn't mean that there isn't corresponding cognitive change to it. So what does all of this have to do with radicalization? As you can see, these are just some headlines that I copy pasted um, from newspapers. Um, especially since the Christchurch attacks, there has been an uptick in interest on gamification because the attack was live streamed and the attacker used gamified language. Um, so now there is a renewed interest and what gamification actually has to do, if anything, with radicalization, with extremism, and with terrorism as such. Um, also in Halle, the perpetrator, and in El Paso, um, they all sort of stem from the same, or appear to stem from the same gamified milieu. So now people have started to conduct the beginning of a research agenda, let's say, um, on gamification and radicalization. And what I have done um, is I wrote an article on sort of the theoretical ap applications of what we already know uh, of, on gamification or about gamification um, and sort of applied it to the context of radicalization. So I'm going to talk about um, a dichotomy or not a dichotomy, but a distinction that I make um, in my paper. One is top-down gamification and the other is bottom-up gamification. So what do I mean by that? Top-down gamification uh, is used by extremist organizations and actual recruiters and strategists um, in a strategic manner. So applied on purpose um, in extremist milieus, communities, uh, online radicalization processes, recruitment processes, etc. Um, strategically applied to facilitate radicalization processes. And what we have been seeing um, is that, for example, in jihadist forums, but also in far-right forums, uh, Stormfront on Discord, etc., um, they have used gamified elements such as um, points, badges, um, rankings, and um, rewards, let's say, where you only after you reach a certain level, you are allowed to enter a secret group in the forum. Um, it's a sort of prestige for people um, and a motivational factor, let's say, to engage in these forums, um, which is actually one of the strategic goals of the organizations using gamification. Um, they want to facilitate engagement and thereby a normalization of the extremist content. Um, it adds to visibility, it's cool, um, it motivates users, and it's really something that especially young audiences uh, find appealing. As you probably know, uh, perpetrators are getting younger and younger. In Germany, we had a 12-year-old trying to plant a bomb at a Christmas market a couple years back. Um, so there's really apparently um, a need by extremist organizations to talk to the really young, um, and that's why top-down gamification is used. In the German-speaking context, the most prominent example is an app called Patriot Peer. Um, it was developed by the Identitarian Movement, uh, which belongs to the Bloc Identitaire in France. Um, it was supposed to connect like-minded individuals and give people a platform to find others in a sort of Pokemon Go-like game. Uh, collect points for uh, different things, like visiting designated cultural places, attending um, identitarian events, etc. The app was never launched, but nevertheless, um, it shows that there is this strategic use of gamification, um, and we're probably going to see more of that in the future. We also see bottom-up gamification, uh, which is not used strategically, but emerges organically, um, either in individuals, small groups, or whole online milieus. We have seen evidence of that, as, we, as I already said, in the live streaming of attacks, um, in the gamified language that is used in certain online milieus, like someone expressed the desire to 
beat his score in relation to the Christchurch attack. So um, that's clearly um, a gamified language coming from the first person shooter games. People are using this language to sort of make sense of their reality. Um, people keep virtual scoreboards, especially in right wing extremist circles. Um, Breivik is leading it with 77 dead, but it shows that there's some sort of competition going on, uh, at least virtually. Why? Why do people do that? Um, it's, of course, to appeal to a certain subcultural milieu, although I have to say that lots of people are uh, now used to video gaming, at least in their childhood, so it could put uh, potentially apply to a lot more people than it does right now. But for now, um, it's really sort of the gaming community um, that they try to appeal to. And then, of course, the extremist groups within that to look cool. I mean, the live streaming of attack is a sort of uh, real life video gaming, um, the sort of let's play videos that you can find on YouTube. That's the sort of visual imagery that these perpetrators try to recreate. Um, and they're basically making sense of their own reality via their gaming experiences, let's say. And we've seen it in Christchurch, in Halle, um, on discussion boards online, on 8chan, on Discord, etc. cetera, um, but also in small groups um, on WhatsApp, for example, um, where groups of young men, for instance, in the UK have gamified their own radicalization experiences by thinking about certain quests that they wanted to, um, to find or to win by stealing certain objects and then treating that um, as sort of they having raided the sorcerer's dungeon, so a real um, sort of World of Warcraft appeal, what they're doing. Um, so we're seeing this more and more, although of course on WhatsApp it's much more difficult to find for academics. So how does this actually work? Gamification, why, why is adding points and a leaderboard and quests and all this sort of stuff, no matter whether it's top down or bottom up, why does that actually matter uh, for radicalization processes? And I'm just gonna quickly um, go through a couple of uh, mechanisms by which it can influence radicalization processes. The most obvious one is it's fun. It's a very engaging way to transmit ideology. Um, it's much more engaging than sitting there and listening to a two hour lecture by Bin Laden, for example. Um, it's, it appeals better to, let's say, a more broader audience who may not want to sit there for two hours and listen to an old guy uh, talking about his or her ideology. Um, so really the pleasure of playing um, and the sort of pop culture appeal that it has but also when we're having fun, um, the reactance, so the, um, the resistance to persuasive attempts is not as pronounced. So if we're thinking, oh, it's just a game, it normalizes whatever is going on in this game and it opens a sort of back door um, for ideology or the transmission of ideology. Games also present positive reinforcement. So in real life, you don't get an immediate reward usually when you do something. Um, but with gamified elements, you get immediate feedback, you immediately get points, or um, you can see yourself rise up the leaderboard, etc. cetera. Um, so you're, you're being provided with instant feedback, um, which provides positive reinforcement. So the, it makes you feel good to gain this reward, which increases the chance that you will engage in that behavior again because you want to feel good again. So it nudges users into a desired behavior um, through rewarding feedback. You have a sense of accomplishment and you just feel good about yourself and then you're motivated to continue engaging and that too can be a sort of slippery slope and you could be drawn deeper into an extremist milieu through this positive reinforcement and feeling good. We also see the importance of empowerment. So in game studies uh, as a whole, um, users are believed to want to feel autonomous and empowered. So a game that really gives you only one route to success is really boring uh, after a while. But if you have different choices and you're sort of finding your own way, whether that's on the soccer uh, field and you're doing different dribblings and shootings and whatnot, 
or you're playing a video game and you can be a merchant, a sorcerer, a fighter, whatever. Um, if you have different routes to engagement, it's much more likely that you will stay engaged. So what extremist organizations do is they offer a variety of choices to engage. You don't have to immediately um, join the extremist group or perpetrate an attack, but you are awarded points for liking pages, for trolling people, uh, for taking part in a protest, as I said, um, and it increases your feeling of competency and self-confidence, which again is this, you're feeling good about yourself, um, so you are more likely to keep engaged. This is also rather obvious. Um, gamification allows for some sort of friendly competition between peers. So users generally differ in the degree of competitiveness that they exhibit. Some really enjoy competition, others not so much. They're just there for the experience. But if you have really ambitious users that want to lead the scoreboard and they want to win, they are going to be very motivated to engage with the extremist material um, and to do all these sort of things that uh, award, award them points, basically. Gamified elements are visual, visible measures of success. So you can actually see how good you're doing. It's not some subjective uh, thing, whether you feel like a leader or you do not feel like a leader, you can actually see, okay, my place is, I don't know, number five on the scoreboard, so that's pretty good, I'm doing pretty well. And that adds, again, to, um, to keeping users engaged and to motivating them um, to, to be engaged because they can increase their social status in the group. Social relatedness, that's basically the, the opposite of competitiveness. So some users really don't care about uh, all the points that they can collect. And basically what, they're, what keeps them engaged is the social relation to others. They're driven by cooperation, by sharing goals, and by being connected and feeling connected. So if you have gamified elements, um, that allow, for example, um, for discussion between the users, a sort of forum, but also um, gamified elements that show the peers' commitment um, to the gamified application and to the group, these people are going to be more motivated to also be engaged. So gamified elements provide social cues. How many points someone has means how committed they are, which also shows um, sort of the group norm for engagement, let's say. And if you're a socially oriented user, that's what you're going to strive for, to be part of that social group. Also, we see in radicalization processes more generally, um, the people looking for, let's say, epic meaning, that's what Cho calls it in his book. Um, it's wanting to be part of something greater than yourself. So even even competitive users may want to feel like they're doing something worthwhile, that they're not just sort of wasting their time on a game that doesn't matter. So if you place gamified elements into a greater narrative um, that affords meaning to simple tasks that will then afford points to the users, um, that's a great chance to, to keep engaged. Right. So what have we seen? Gamification, whether we like it or not, is up and coming and it's here to stay. So it's better to engage with it right now rather than sort of wait and see what it does to radicalization processes. Um, I've talked about how extremist organizations seem to be aware. We, of course, don't know for sure, but we think they are aware of the benefits of gamification and have started to use them for strategic purposes. But also we see an organic bottom-up process of gamification independently of organizations where small groups and online milieus are using their gaming uh, experiences to make sense of reality and to make sense of their social surroundings. Um, and as I have just talked about, there's a variety of psychological mechanisms that underpin gamification and that make it more likely, let's say, um, for radicalization to occur if gamified elements are there. So, this is the slide I was talking about in the beginning. Um, how can I get started? Basically, what I've done just here is to list 
um, some of the sources that I have used, which I think are um, suitable for people to start their journey of gamification, if you will. Um, the first three are the TED Talks that I will give you uh, in just a couple of minutes. I will give you a choice to watch one of the three. Um, there's also a podcast by Tech Against Terrorism on this topic, um, various books and articles that you can take a look at um, if you're interested in a deeper understanding of this topic, because this presentation, of course, was just a sort of overview of what I have found so far. So now, do you have any questions? Oh, yes, there is a, a question from Zuzanna. How did you uh, come across this issue? Um, I was reading the new book uh, by Julia Ibna. It's called Going Dark. Um, and she talks about um, what I said about the Discord service, about right-wing groups sort of gamifying their, um, their experiences on Discord. Um, and I thought, wow, that's, that's very interesting. I want to know more about that. But I couldn't find anything basically in the library research that I did uh, online. And it, it became very evident very fast that there's literally nothing out there on gamification of radicalization, probably because it's such a new topic and Christchurch was only two years ago. And as you may know, the academic publishing process just takes a while. Um, and so, yeah, I thought, well, if that's the case, um, then I'm going to write one myself, let's say. Perfect idea for uh, creating a niche. <laughs> yes. And I see uh, a question from Denisa. Is gamification and a bad thing overall? No, not at all. That's actually a great question. Um, it's not a bad thing overall. It works really well for people who want to lose weight, for example. It works on fitness apps. It works to keep people more organized, etc. There are lots of great things that you can do with gamification. And actually, the TED Talks that we're going to watch in a couple of minutes um, are on this topic about what, what can gamification offer um, to make the world a better place and not just a darker place. So I've given you now how it facilitates radicalization, but you will see um, in a couple of minutes that actually there's a lot of potential for gamification to make our lives better. Zuzanna made a comment. Yeah, um, I think as an extremism scholar in general, uh, you have to, you stop being terrified at some point, um, I think. Otherwise you can't, you can't really do that. Um, I actually thought it was fascinating how um, it's a topic that only really came up in like generally in advertisement around 10 years ago and already uh, it's being picked up by extremist organizations and players. Um, so it shows how fast they're learning obviously, um, but it's also really interesting. The field keeps changing and changing and there's never, uh, never boredom, let's say, with that topic. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So maybe I am now going to copy paste uh, the links to the TED Talks. Um, just very quickly, uh, maybe uh, the first one, Shu, he, is, um, he wrote a book um, on gamification. Um, he's a consultant, um, a business consultant, um, and he talks about how to improve our world with gamification and how that might be possible. Uh, McGonagall is a game designer, so she has a slightly different take on the matter. It's more video gamey, if you want, and less gamification. But she too talks about the psychological processes um, that may help uh, to make the world better via gamification. Uh, and Zickerman is an entrepreneur, um, and he too talks about how um, gamification actually increases creativity and innovation, um, and we should definitely all be using it. That's basically what he will be talking about. Um, the talks are all between 16 and 19 minutes long, um, so about the same. Um, so we should all be, we should all be good uh, in using that in the next 20 minutes. Let's see. 
Um, so as you can see on my screen, I put up some questions for the discussion. You don't have to follow uh, the questions. It's just to give you something to, to hold on to. Um, but of course, I would be very interested um, to hear which talk you watched and sort of what struck with you, um, what you're taking away from it. And then we can go into further detail about applying gamification, et cetera. So if anyone feels like uh, giving the first comment, please feel free. Everyone's being shy, I see. <laughs> we are a very, you know, small group. Uh, we know a little bit each other after uh, a couple of sessions yesterday and today. So please join us. It will be nice. Linda, by the way, maybe your, uh, your uh, video will also <laughs> can be also be available. You want me to risk it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's, 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 see. Uh, let's see. Let's see what it, if it doesn't work. It's not my fault. <laughs> okay. Now I see. I see you and a lot of books. Yes. Behind you. So Denisa um, says that it was super interesting. The first one, gamification to improve our world. Valentina, last two minutes of. Ziherman. Yeah, it was a bit longer than the first talk. So if they watch that, then it took two minutes longer. Mm -hmm. The first one. Ki, uh, Kian, I watched the same uh, as Denisa. Was it interesting <laughs> or boring? <laughs> Yeah, in terms of maybe the age, um, because Valentina just said about young people, um, gamification, uh, we don't really know yet what are the parameters where it works best. Um, but generally, the younger someone is, um, the better it works. At least the sort of very simple um, points, leaderboards, badges type of gamification uh, works actually very well in, in kids. Um, and not so much in older adults, they tend to need more of a, a narrative behind it, the sort of epic meaning that I talked about in order for this to, to be fun. Just putting points on something is not going to do it usually for, um, for adults. Uh, what else do we have? Yeah, it's a really complex process, um, Kian, it's true. Um, and there's, as I said, there's little research. I mean, 10 years is nothing basically as an academic field. Um, so there's much, much more um, that we need to find out um, about the parameters, when it works, how it works, which elements uh, are combined best. Because right now what's happening is that most people are just applying some points and a leaderboard and think that's enough for sustained engagement. And it is for a while, but if you want engagement that lasts longer than a couple of days, um, for it to stay interesting, there needs to be something more um, than just a couple of points um, slapped onto something, basically. So that's a good point, but um, it's really difficult to say because we're lacking the research. Uh, Susanna? Um, yeah, I think in a way it's a generational shift, but on the other hand, I mean, I don't know, how old you guys are, how old my audience is. Um, I was born in 92, so um, I, do, I did grow up playing Game Boy, playing video games. So I think the generational shift is not so much in the experience of digital games because we all have that. It's more um, in terms of how do we use these elements in a cool and meaningful way. Because again, as I said, not sure if it's enough to just slap some points into something. Um, about the social skills, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I think there's probably research on how video games as such affect cognition and affect social skills. Um, but then again, I'm not sure because things like World of Warcraft, for example, you need a lot of um, social skills to really play this well because you're in groups and you have to coordinate and they're on team speak constantly. Um, so it's a bit difficult, I think, to um to say sort of in which way it changed social skills um but it's definitely a good point sort of asking yourself if i'm i don't know mid 40s can i meaningfully gamify an 
and experience um, for a 10 year old. Um, so that's something definitely to, to think about. And about, um, and about this uh, generational differences and generation Z, uh, on the day three, we will have Matteo who will present the research about uh, approach of um, people in their 30s and 40s to generation Z and what does it mean in terms of engagement of young people to, 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 to our cause. I mean, our different causes. All right. Um, so Maria's question is, could gamification lead to action which is extrinsically motivated by awards rather than intrinsic motivation? Um, I think it depends. I think in the simplest form, gamification is about extrinsic rewards. It's about um, points. It's about leading the scoreboard and things like that. Um, but I think, again, if you want to sustain engagement with something beyond, let's say, a week where it gets boring to just collect your points and always do the same thing, um, you also need a bit more uh, content, let's say, that is also um, rewarding in itself. As I said, maybe the, the epic narrative, for example, that could really um, sort of make sense uh, for the users then to to collect the points. Um, and also, of course, what we what I haven't said, but um, it's of course important to understand that gamification as such is never going to be enough to radicalize someone. Um, so if gamification adds some extrinsic motivation, but other parts of the extremist movement or the the group that the person is in, um, give them that intrinsic motivation that you're talking about, then that's probably a more potent form um, of gamification than just pretending that it's enough to, um, to radicalize people as such. So if you take the game elements away, yes, if the person by then has not um, developed some form of intrinsic motivation, it's probably gonna do nothing. But gamified elements can draw people into the movement, uh, and can sort of normalize extremist content. And if that um, sort of opened a door towards radicalization and towards, let's say, uh, engagement with recruiters, for example, and sort of looking up the narrative and engaging um, with the cognitive aspects of it, um, then yeah. the game elements away probably doesn't matter because the radicalization is then already underway. Yeah, gamification is used in a lot uh, in a lot of different contexts, Denisa, um, in education. But you probably watched a talk where it's talking about the protein uh, that was solved um, as well um, via a game. I think there are basically endless applications uh, of gamification. Um, we're just not there yet, research-wise, to really explain it. It somehow works, as we see in different uh, in different apps and in different games and in different sort of circumstances. Um, the problem is explaining it to then being able to apply it by now. Mm, or right now, it's a bit of by chance um, whether something works or not. Ioana, um, I hope I pronounce your name right. Uh, watched the first talk and is asking about the final point that the speaker makes, uh, that he would like to see a world that would function more and more like a fun game where every mundane task would be part of a fun quest. I'm wondering whether that's actually a really good thing. Um, yeah, I mean, we're already underway, I think. Um, you know, people are tracking their sleep on their smartwatches and, um, it yells at them if they didn't take 10,000 steps that day. Um, so I think we're already on the way to sort of gamify our world. I'm also not sure whether that's really a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, we sort of naturally gamify things for our children. Um, if they don't want to brush their teeth and you come up with some sort of clever game um, to make them do it, is that really a bad thing or, um, I think it really depends on the context that we're talking about. Um, but if, you know, if everything is a game, nothing is a game, I guess. 
Um, my personal point of view is that there also needs to be some form of boredom to create creativity, because if we gamify everything, um, then gaming as such or playing as such becomes meaningless. So yeah, I would agree that it may not be a really good thing um, if really everything was gamified. Uh, Denisa asks, have we reached a point where all our motivation comes from awards? That's a really good question. It's probably a philosophical question uh, more than a, uh, an academic question for me to answer. Um, as I said, I think we're starting to see that the sort of uh, we need to be a certain weight and eat a certain thing and we're tracking all of this on our smartphone and then we're looking at uh, how many hours did we sleep and the sort of uh, there are these sort of terrible books like why great people get up at 5 a.m. and things like that. Um, so yeah, I think in our individualistic world, that's what we're moving towards is that everything has to be done for a reason. There's nothing that we do um, that's just for us to enjoy, let's say. Everything is, uh, is part of an award system. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a really philosophical question and whether that's a good thing or not, we'll see. Yeah, it's deep. It's maybe too deep uh, for me to sort of answer meaningfully um, with my research. It's something that, you know, we can have a discussion about um, whether that's a good thing or not. Yeah, um, Joanna, I think I think that's true. I think, in a way, gamification is a great start. It's a great motivator, but I doubt that it's enough uh, to keep people engaged, at least the majority of people. I mean, how many people play World of Warcraft? A lot, but how many people actually play at a level um, that's, you know, meaningful in a way. Um, and that's probably a, really a minority of people that log on every day for eight hours and do that. Um, so I think gamification starts you off and it can draw people in and it can be um, effective in facilitating engagement, as I talked about, um, but it's most definitely not enough. It's not something that will magically fix all the problems and it's also not something that magically radicalizes people um it there always needs to be a combination of things one more question linda from maria so if you can take it sure um yeah i am not a psychologist so uh, i only have sort of limited knowledge on that but yes that's that's basically what i meant uh, in terms of creativity, if even if we have a choice of path of uh, reaching things, like what I talked about in empowerment, they're still pre-made um, to to what you have to do in order to be successful. So the the success is quantified and is defined by whoever designed the application. Um, and I think in the real world, you need some form of boredom and creativity because otherwise there will not be progress. There will always have to be someone to tell you, oh, this means success or this this is something that you should be doing. Um, whereas if you take that away, um, people have to find their own path. And that's probably a better thing. So again, I don't agree with, uh, with Shu on that point um, when he says he wants to see the whole world gamified. Um, but I also don't think that's a realistic scenario. Thank you.